And we are live. Welcome to another episode of Roasting Marshmallows. My name is Rolf Suit, and I am your host. Uh, most people don't grow up learning very much about their emotions, uh, what they are, how they work, or how to manage them well. Uh, this means that there are a lot of people out there with uh, perfectly normal levels of academic or social intelligence, but very low or somewhat low emotional intelligence. Uh, emotional intelligence means the capacity to reflect on and understand your emotional life. Uh, because the clearer you can be about your emotions, what they are and how they work, the better you'll be able to manage the most difficult and painful ones. Uh, thankfully, we can all improve our emotional intelligence with a little learning and some practice. Uh, this is important, not just for ourselves, but for our children as well. To help us improve, we have Mark Brackett on the show today. Uh, Mark is the founding director of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence and a professor in the Child Study Center, Yale School of Medicine at Yale University. His most recent book, Permission to Feel, explores ways for our emotions to help rather than hinder our well-being and success at home, in school, at work, and in everyday life. Uh, welcome, Mark. Thank you. Glad to be with you guys. Four guys talking about feelings. This yeah. is perfect. Yeah, it's going to be word is changing. It's going to be great. <laughs> uh, I'm joined uh, today uh, by uh, two regulars, of course, uh, Arno and Henrique. Welcome, guys. Thanks. Thanks. I'm looking forward for this conversation because, uh, well, your bookmark basically, well, gave me the permission to feel. So I'm uh, quite curious to, uh, yeah, hear you from the questions that I have that awesome. seem like there that couldn't get answered. Yeah. So, uh, so Mark, um, you know, we've read a bit about like um, your your background uh, in terms of like why you wrote the book. Uh, but can you maybe mm -hmm. explain to the audience uh, about like the uncle that you had and 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 how it uh, opened your eyes to to yeah to get in touch with your uh, emotions? Sure. Well, as you know from you know the opening of my book, you know I had a pretty tough childhood. Um, the uh, there was abuse involved in my childhood. There was a lot of bullying involved in my childhood. And, you know, you grew up thinking there's nothing you can do about this. Mm -hmm. You know, like you're powerless because an adult has power over you. And when there's lots of kids being mean or cruel to you, you're like, what can I do with this information? Yeah. I had two parents who loved me. That was clear. But, um, you know, my mother was very anxious, and so she was always worrying about something and having her know her know her breakdowns, and and so that was hard. Um, I was like, well, if I you know approach my mother with my issues, you know, she's going to have another nervous breakdown. So, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to do that. And I had a father who was also a good guy, but um, he was you know kind of this tough guy kind of mentality. Right. So like, son, you got to toughen up. And, um, and I realized, I guess I, you know, I don't think I'm a tough guy. <laughs> so if I tell my, you know, my, if I share what's happening to me, like I'm being bullied, you know, my father's going to think I'm weak mm. or he's just going to tell me to toughen up. And so what happens is that you are alone with all of those strong feelings Yeah. and not great things happen. And so now to your real question is I was blessed to have an uncle who happened to be writing a curriculum to teach kids about their emotions. Yeah. And um, we built a relationship when I was around 11 and 12 years old, you know, and he was the first adult that actually, you know, really cared about how I was feeling. And he yeah. was the first adult that I shared everything I was going through with. And that was such a profound experience for you that you actually, you know, made a career out of it, uh, basically. It's, you know, it's interesting, you know, I mean, I have... I, of course, in a book, you can't go into my book's not about me. It's really right. about the work. Yeah. Yeah. But there's so many nuances, you know, to what my relationship with my uncle, you know, did to support me in healing mm -hmm. um, and also in having purpose in life. Yeah. I was confused about what I really want. I was going to be a teacher. I was going to be a lawyer. I was going to be an actor or comedian. <laughs> uh, now I feel like I'm all the above. So. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a professor, so. Right, and so, uh, uh, yeah, go ahead, guys. I have one question. Yeah. So, I don't, I'm not sure if your father is still around, but did he actually see you go through this? Like, pursue this career? He did. You know, initially, um, my father, you know, when I told him I wanted to be a professor, he was like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> they make crap money. You know, like, really? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, uh, 
when I became a professor at Yale and I had this center that I created, you know, um, all of a sudden, you know, it was like, my son is a professor <laughs> at Yale. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, you know, it, it's pretty interesting, you know, how you can, how people can, you know, shift their perspectives. Yeah. Yeah. So, so did he approve to the subject or did he have an issue with it? You know, it's interesting, you know, because we had, I had a tough childhood, um, you know, it wasn't easy to talk to my father about feelings, although he was psychologically minded, you know, who's in therapy all the time. Oh. Um, and so it's interesting, but I think he just was so afraid for his son, mm -hmm. you know, that in many ways, you know, he didn't know how to deal with it. Yeah. And he also didn't have any emotional intelligence training. Yeah. So but, it goes um, back to his past as well. Yeah. My father's upbringing was a nightmare. Mm. You know, his mother, my grandmother was, had severious, serious mental health issues. And so did, I think my grandfather, you know, um, yeah. and so what did, how, what skills did my father learn about how to raise an emotionally intelligent child? Yeah. And is your uncle like uh, the brother of your father or your mother? My mother. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. so um, you know, we're all parents here, at least uh, and he, Arno and me uh, are. And uh, I must admit that, um, at least for me, I'm kind of doing the same that your father did. Like my son is 10 years old and sometimes he's scared of going on the escalator without holding hands. And I tell him like, you know, don't be such a, don't be such a baby. <laughs> And, yeah. uh, well, maybe not that literally, but I, you know, I try to teach him to, you know, in my way to, well, to become yeah. independent, I guess. And, mm -hmm. um, and in your, uh, your introduction, you mentioned that, uh, you know, serious issues, uh, occurred with, you know, that kind of, uh, of upbringing. So am I, am I damaging my son by, by, by doing this kind of stuff and what, what kind of yeah. damage could I be causing? Permanent brain damage. Oh my God. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Well, at least he has a brain then. That's good, right? <laughs> Just kidding. Um, the, so a couple of things, Yeah. you know, first is, you know, what is the need that you have to say these things? You know, it's, it's, yeah. cause it's nothing to do with your kid. It's all about you, right? Right. Yeah. It's your fears, it's your insecurities, you know? Yeah. And so I think just being aware of that is really important. And then the second is, you know, you want your kid to grow up with self-esteem. You want your kid to grow up with confidence. Yeah. And so if you are endlessly saying things that make the kid feel inferior or not good enough or not skilled enough, like it's just not helpful. Mm -hmm. You know, there's better ways to communicate, you know, like maybe trying to understand where that fear is coming from Yeah. and saying, let's talk through this. Let's think about the strategies that could be helpful. But it's yeah. so hard, you know, if you look at, this stuff happens a lot, like during the day. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm always in a rush. And then yeah. boom, you're there. And I have three kids, three young kids. And then let's say the middle one goes off, whatever you call it. And then the other two are also pulling like, come on, we we'll go, we we'll go. <laughs> and then you have yeah. to keep your calm, think about yourself. And then I think it's a, mm -hmm. it's a struggle for me anyways. I always say like, how much time do you spend on social media? Right. And how much time do you spend watching Netflix? How much time do you spend, you know, reading, you know, the news? I'm actually uh, very much below average on that, but, uh, on all of those. Yeah. Um, I'm sure that you, there are things that you do in your day, right. You know, where you're spending, you know, I'm not going to, I don't know you, so I'm not saying that you're wasting your time. But I can tell you, it's like exercise, right? Yeah. Yeah. Nobody has the time to work out. No. Not really true. You yeah. know, like, no, it's priorities, basically. Well, right. It's making something it's valuable, you know, and, you know, we, you know, whatever your career is, what is your career actually, Arno? I'm one of the uh, agile coaches at Force Scouts. So as I yeah. mentioned before the podcast, we help companies, well, improve, improve their processes, organization-wise or software-wise. Right. So you're spending a lot of time probably thinking through solutions for other people. Yeah. You know, you could do a little bit more for yourself. <laughs> well, I agree. 
You are here for a reason, so <laughs> I'm already down that path. <laughs> yeah, no, but like if if we if we rotate, right? Because I can I totally agree with you on that. But let's say I have just uh, maybe to give a little bit of context. Uh, well, I didn't want to be a father, and I became a father, and uh, well, now my son is three years old. And I did not know anything about emotions or feelings, right? I was one of those men that is basically would say, well, emotions is on my way to achieve whatever I need to achieve. So I cannot be constantly emotional. Otherwise, okay. So I was very much on that uh, line of thinking. Don't ask me how I learned that because I have no idea. Uh, and wow, well, when he born, flipped the switch in my brain that kind of blocked me. And I don't know, there was like brain not talking to emotions. Mm -hmm. And that's when I came across your book and that I could understand like, oh, apparently I've been looking this the wrong way the whole time. Mm -hmm. And uh, now he's three mm -hmm. and he can communicate a little bit better, but mm -hmm. sometimes you just ask and they don't answer you. And then I think that the question is mostly like, then is there an age that you can start talking to kids that they finally understand or not really? The answer is that, you know, you can start this work before they're even conceived, uh, okay. you know, truthfully, you oh. know, as a, we know from research that how kids experience, right, the womb affects their development. And so, you know, your wife, uh, or partner who, you know, or ex <laughs> or ex or whatever, the mother of your child, um, <laughs> the uh right has feelings during pregnancy those feelings are you know um are filtering through that child mm. yeah. um your energy you know around that around the mother around pregnancy affects the fetus so i mean i don't need to be so you know it, it really is true yeah um, and so, you know, your facial expression, your body language, your vocal tone and in infancy all create either a pleasant, comfortable emotional climate or a scary one. Yeah. And how does that affect the child then if it's in the womb? I don't get it. What does the, what does the research say? That there are more anxiety or more, more depressed? Well, or... it can affect it, it. It basically, you know, can impact their neural development. And so you're, if you, if you are a mom who has, you know, greater levels of stress, those stress hormones are flooding through the blood system, right? Of the yep. entire body and that baby's in that body. And so uh, think about it in the worst scenario of alcohol, right? You know, yep. fetal yep. alcohol syndrome. So that's an, ex that's an exaggerated example of uh, a mother's behavior that could impact, you know, a child's development. Well, we tend to not think of psychology being as powerful as maybe alcohol, but mm -hmm. it can be. Right. So that's basically brings me to the idea of like what I've did is wrong. Right. So it gives me this guilt feeling of like, oh shit, I already damaged my kid. <laughs> well, I mean, I've done this. I, you know, I can't tell you when I do presentations, <clears throat> like I talk about, you know, the role, how bullying develops or really influences brain development. Um, and mothers who are fathers who are mean and cruel to the kids say to me, like, are you telling me I damaged my kid's brain? And I'm like, it definitely influenced your child's development. Yep. But the great news for all of us is that the brain is plastic and it's malleable. And so it's never too early to intervene. It's never too earlier to be, to go from being the mean, cruel, critical to the, caring, yeah. loving, compassionate. Yeah. Okay. That's good news. Well. indeed. <laughs> it is good news, but a long path for yourself. <laughs> yeah, because it starts there. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, is that also solely the parents job? Because um, I can also imagine that schools have uh, a huge part in this as well, because they, of course, uh, see the children many hours yeah. per week as well. Um, and yeah. Everybody's responsible. Yeah. Is Everybody's it... responsible. The bus driver's responsible. Right. The, the person who, uh, if you have a nanny or, a, yeah. you know, grandfather, a babysitter, yeah. grandparents, everyone who interacts <clears throat> with the child, right, affects the development. I mean, think about my development. You know, 
a person who lived, you know, up the block from where I was, who mm -hmm. was the pedophile, dramatically changed my development. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I didn't live with yeah. that person, but obviously the time I spent with that person had pretty serious, pretty serious uh, implications yeah. for my right. Exactly. And of course, we're talking about children a lot, but, um, you know, these people grow up and, and uh, they, you know, hopefully get a job at one point and they land in a team somewhere in, in, in a company. Um, I'm looking at it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, uh, and well, my parents did not have your book, so uh, <laughs> maybe I should give my mother a copy. But, um, <laughs> you know, because I don't know, man. No, but, but at work, we, but, but at work and at school, we talk a lot about results, right? We want, you know, we need grades, we need this diploma, we need, you know, the, the quarterly numbers to be met, right? So there's not a whole lot of room for, for you know, emotional intelligence at, at work. How do you start that conversation with and, and with who? If you want to make a change. Honestly, it, it starts at the top. And so, right, the CEO, the leader, the, the big boss needs to be someone who is comfortable with emotions. It will make a big difference. Yeah. You know, I, my, uh, our center at Yale, we're a team of 60 people. And so, you know, the question is a lot of people ask me this, like, can you like really share how you're feeling these days with your team? Mm -hmm. And I say, I try to be as honest as I can be, but not in a way that makes people think that the center is going to crumble right or that you know i can't handle yeah. you know my feelings so yeah. there's a big difference as a leader or a manager walking into a team meeting saying i'm having a breakdown i can't take it anymore i think the world's going to come to an end the stock market's crashing everybody's working from home i don't trust anybody's doing their work yeah it's like oh crap like yeah mark's losing it i'm going to get another job as opposed to you know I don't know if you've read the newspaper, but Omicron seems to be, you know, really spreading fast. Yep. And yep. I think we need to be super careful and it makes me nervous to be out in the world right now. And so I'm taking a break from traveling and I want to really protect myself and my family. And I encourage all of you to do the same. Yeah. Um, big difference, right? In terms of like yeah, yeah. making everybody activated versus communicating how you're feeling as well as communicating the strategy that you're using to manage the feeling. To me, that's the critical piece is that you don't just share the feeling you share out loud mm -hmm. what your effective strategy is. So because in your book, you, you, you create this, well, I, I think you use the word framework, right? The ruler. Yeah. Uh, thing. <laughs> And so would you say then from the CEO point of view, he would go through all this ruler stage, like the recognition, understanding, labeling, expressing, yeah. and then he would basically do this whole work himself before he would express this to the people. It's always intra interpersonal. It's always self and other. It's the whole set of skills are, are both individual and collective. Right. So it's how am I feeling? How are you feeling right now? Right. Mm -hmm. It's like, how do I feel being on this, you know, webcast with three strangers from the Netherlands, yeah. you know, yeah. I'm not going to share how I feel about that right now. <laughs> um, and then, you know, how are the three of you feeling, you know, about, you know, interviewing me? Mm -hmm. um, do I understand my feelings? Why am I having this feeling? Do I understand why you're feeling the way you're feeling? Am I using the right language? And then the question is, am I managing? Like if I were anxious right now, what would be my strategy for managing my anxiety? Yeah. Um, if I noticed that you guys were nervous interviewing me, what would be my strategy to help make you feel less nervous? So leaders, parents, teachers, anyone, right, who's interacting with people are always going through this kind of back and forth with emotion, Yeah. whether you're yeah. of it or not. Right. But I think the part that, like, say, at least for me, right, I discovered your book, uh, I think already two years ago. And basically for me, I don't have the tools, the techniques I didn't learn when I was 11, right? So when I read, oh, you have to recognize. And I went, for example, to psychologists and psychologists, yeah, just tell me how you feel. Like, 
what you mean? I, I don't really know how to even look at it. Like, mm -hmm. And some of them just say, ah, look at your feet. They're like, what you mean, look at my feet? Yeah, you have to look inside. So I think the part that is very hard is like, how do you even learn to recognize that there's something going on if you mm -hmm. never did for, yeah, I don't know, 30 years, that's my case. Um, yeah, I mean, this is, this is why, you know, my work is developmental because, you know, how you teach this and learn this, yeah. um, in preschool is different than elementary or, you know, primary school, then middle school, then high school, then college and in the workplace, because yeah. right, I didn't have to manage a team when I was in kindergarten, Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, you know, now I do. Um, you know, I wasn't married when I was in middle school. Now I am. Yeah. And, um, it's a different context and the skills are more complex as you develop. So this is why I feel like we need to start early and kind of build upon, you know, the skills. Yeah. So I, I have to somehow like figure it out how to learn that basically mm -hmm. that's what i understand well you manage right but, i mean uh well i so don't know you might not be <laughs> you, you might me. not be there yet but I'm pretty sure you're making progress so i think sometimes i do and sometimes i just know that there is something going on but i have no idea yeah. like i just can't uh, understand it i cannot label it i cannot uh yeah even dream of expressing it right. <laughs> it's just there Something is there. I wrote my book, right? So yeah. I'm trying to help, you know, that's the beginning of your journey um, is like reading a book and reflecting on it. Obviously, even doing these kinds of conversations helps to make it deeper. Yeah. Um, but then you, you can go further. You know, this is why I actually started a company a couple of years ago mm -hmm. called OG Life Lab, because I wanted, I was, I would do all these presentations for companies and they'd say like, well, how do we go deeper? And, you know, it's not Mark doing 500 workshops for the company, <laughs> right? Um, it's helping the employees really build the skills over time and get yeah. to Because coaching and feedback is important for this. Yep. Yeah. You know, like we're not that, we're not that self-aware, you know, no. we're, we tend to be a little bit, um, we tend to overestimate, you know, our skills, you know, like oh, yes. I'm, a, I'm a leader. Like, of course I can read people. Well, it's like, guess what? Um, I can't tell you how many like managers and leaders I've met that say, you know, there's one thing I'm certain of, Mark, it's my emotional intelligence. I'm like, there's one thing I'm certain of is you are not self-aware. <laughs> yeah. I can agree with that. So, so what do you yeah, advise them? Not foolish. I mean, the thing is, how could you be self-aware about something you don't even know anything about? Right. Yes. And so. Yeah. My other career that you, I don't know if you know, is I was a martial arts instructor for 25 years. And so I have a fifth degree black belt in a martial art called Hapkido. Yep. It's a Korean martial that art. I don't know what it is. <laughs> it's a Korean martial art, essentially, okay. that teaches, you know, you know how to twist wrists and break yeah. elbows yeah. and crack necks. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. um, <laughs> all those good things. Um, but, uh, and I, the reason why I, I, I like to use it as a parallel is that, you know, there's requirements for a yellow belt, a blue belt, yep. a black yeah. belt. And you got to practice, you got to refine, you get evaluated. We don't really have that for emotional intelligence. There's no criterion. No. There's no, um, like, feedback. Yeah. That's not really yeah, something you can measure. Is it? You just can't measure it. You can. We, we've been working on that, actually. So there are okay. ways to measure. And is this something you implement at companies? <clears throat> um, we have worked with companies. In this. It's not about like your self report, though, right? Like if I ask you, like, I, how good are you at reading faces? Yeah. Yeah. Really doesn't have very much meaning. Mm -hmm. But if I show you 25 facial expressions and videos and ask you, what emotion do you think that person is experiencing? Yeah. And you yeah, okay. think all happy people are angry, right? <laughs> then uh, we got a problem. <laughs> yeah. 
But it can also be a state of mind, right? Because I read somewhere that like if you're in a depression state, then you tend to see things a bit more negative as well. So that yeah. makes, I think, you probably read that in my book, just saying. <laughs> okay, then it was in your book. <laughs> um, it's not my research, but yes. Um, our mood state, how we feel, biases the way we see the world. Yeah. For the good and the bad, right? So yeah. your, your three-year-old or five, how old is your, is your child still three? Yeah, three, yeah. Yeah. So they're, they're starting to talk and, you know, want things for Christmas. I don't know. Yeah. Um, you know, they're going to want daddy to be in a good mood, right? Because daddy's going to buy them more stuff. If daddy's irritable or angry or overwhelmed, you know, daddy's less likely to buy good stuff yeah. for them. And so um, mood can bias things. And we, you know, we tell people, great job, even though it's not even that great because we're in a good yes. mood. We're overly critical, right? when we're irritable. Yeah. And like, uh, how, how, how do you see, like, for example, and that's a part that I also found a bit hard on this process of, uh, let's say, understand the emotions and feelings. And in your book, you do explain actually the difference between feelings and emotions. And I think I read three times that part and I keep not knowing the difference between feelings and emotions. Yeah. Uh, and like, I had this experience at work, right? We are all sitting, we are having an important meeting. It was not you guys, so be okay with it's it. It's okay, man. And uh, <laughs> and then eventually we have to make a decision. We are mm -hmm. like tight in time and somebody just starts crying in the middle of the whole thing. And then we try to be, you know, supportive and we talk and we listen, but eventually the decision still needs to be made. And then we are all there sitting, everybody have no idea what to do. <laughs> And then what would your advice to be in that situation? Like, yeah, do we comfort that person? Do we ask the person to leave? Do you, I found this so weirdly hard. Give me the specific, give me a specific scenario. Yeah. So, uh, that person had to make a choice, right? Like there was a, B and C, and then was that the boss was there. We were there as coaches and there was a bunch of other developers. And then the guy was a bit, a bit, bit pushy, right? Like, Hey, we need this to be done. We need this to be done as soon as possible. And I think she felt a little overwhelmed and then mm -hmm. she just cracks down and cried. And then everybody started looking at each other and like, okay, what do we do now? Go. Cool. And nobody did anything. <laughs> yeah. That's, I mean, that's cause everybody's afraid of the feelings, right? Yes. And so I was totally terrified by it. I didn't honestly didn't know had a clue. You know, I would say something like, you know, it's pretty clear we have some strong feelings, you know, in the room right now. How about we take a 10 minute break? Everybody going to drink a coffee, a glass of water or something yeah. like that. And, you know, I want to check in with check in with the team and then we'll come back. And then you go up to this person who was there's a guy who was being kind of too strong. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And just say, you know, I'm just curious, like what's going on? You know, you know, what, 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 what made you kind of react that way? Or, you know, oh, I can't take it. You know, and you got to learn, you got to be the learner. You know, that's my theory. Yeah. Be, in learning mode, be the compassionate chapter two, right? Yes. <laughs> the compassionate emotion scientist, not the critical judge, you know, and then also have to set boundaries, you know, and say, you know, obviously it didn't land well with this woman. And so we need to figure out a way to um, make this person feel more comfortable in the meeting. And, um, and, and like, for example, if in the example you gave before, right, let's say if she would apply this, the, your, let's say your framework with uh, the ruler and then uh, eventually, let's say this whole process would have to happen extremely quick. It does. Yeah. But for me, that process takes days, for example, like, <laughs> because you're not practice. It's like, you know, um, it's like, again, going back to the martial arts, like yeah. doing a running up in the air and doing a flying sidekick, yeah. you know, is not hard for someone who's practiced it for 10 years. And so this is a muscle. This is not easy. Oh man. That's, and, that's a bad news. Yeah. I didn't <laughs> want to hear that. <laughs> I'm sorry. It just, it is what it is. Yeah. You know, and it's like, you got to be comfortable failing at it and just say it up front. Um, 
Yeah, and, it's work. And, it's effort. And did you notice any cultural differences on this? Like on confidence, where they where you should respond differently, or there's no difference? There's differences, not major ones. I mean, you guys seem pretty normal to me. <laughs> We're trying. <laughs> yeah, so I take that as a compliment. <laughs> as after reading um, your book, by the way. Of course, I take all the credit. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I think what the research would show in terms of the real difference, it's in kind of the cultural rules around expressing. And so, you know, if you're from Italy, you know, you, everybody, Marco, 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 mm, mm, mm. you know, I love going to Italy. Everybody kisses me all the time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know, man. If only come, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> You know, you go to Asia and there's no kissing, um, it's bowing or, you know, and so it's not as if bowing is bad and kissing is good or kissing is bad and bow, you know, yeah. it's like that, that, that mindset around the judgment of the behavior for how we greet people needs to just be thrown away. Again, we enter it as the curious emotion scientist saying, oh, it's interesting. People here behave this way, behave that way. I wonder why they do that. Yeah. Um, but they, I think what the research would argue is that people's experience of emotion is pretty universal. Like, have you ever felt jealous of another guy? Yeah, of course. Yeah. 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 You know, have you ever felt envious of something someone else had that you didn't have? Yeah. yeah. Ever felt overwhelmed at work? Baby, yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Disappointed in your own progress towards a goal. Yeah. Yeah. Anxious about what's going to happen with business. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. And so like, guess what guys, you're like every other guy. Sorry. Um, <laughs> and Such a you, know, like, <laughs> <laughs> you have other things that you can be uh, unique about your creativity. Um, but you know, we're all human beings that are built to have feelings. The question is, you know, how aware are we of our feelings and how well do we regulate them? And I think, you know, too many people, as you said, I think, Rolf, in your intro, think that it's all about performance and academics yeah. and cognition. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as a person who works at a very, you know, a high powered university with people with very high academic intelligence, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I was under the assumption, you know, that every one of my students was going to be brilliant. Um, and every one of them was going to achieve their dreams in life and, you know, become the senator or the CEO or the billionaire, you know, and so many students don't achieve their dreams. And it's a lot of times because they don't have emotional intelligence. Really? Because they don't deal well with feedback and they get completely angry at the feedback or disappointed in the feedback um, or overwhelmed by it. And then they just give um, up or... Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Or they're doing something creative and they get feedback. That's like, you know what, this could be more creative. Like you're not pushing yourself hard enough. And they're like, go blank yourself. Who do you think you are giving me that yeah, feedback? I know right. how creative I am. Yeah. And, um, and so if you're not open to feedback, if you're not willing to work collaboratively on a team. I think oftentimes life is not as easy for you. Even if you have the perfect scores in every standardized test. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the emotional part. So I didn't know that that categorizes an emotional intelligence. But that's changeable, right? As you said, so the brain it, is plastic. These people can mm, learn. Of course. Yeah. It is. But the thing is that, you know, unfortunately, you know, in at least American culture, um, when you're brought up in a family that only nurtures your academic skills, um, then you get to become a student of mine. And I say, guess what? You know, um, <laughs> Like there are other skills that you're going to need to really succeed. Well, I got into Yale, you know, I've had students say things like I didn't need emotional intelligence to get into Yale. And I say, well, guess what? You're going to need those skills to get out. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I say that jokingly, but at the same time, um, I mean it because I mean, have you ever worked for someone who didn't have emotional intelligence? Yes, yeah, probably. It's not the most enjoyable experience. No. No. Dismissive, 
doesn't really care about your life experiences. You know, very black yeah. and white about things. So, and then, uh, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Where does this come from? That's what I'm wondering. Is this something culturally just grows from, I don't know, pain in the past? Or is it? Where did the lack of emotional intelligence come from? Yeah. I think it comes from biology and nurture, meaning that <clears throat> we, you know, we like immediate gratification. Yeah, as people. And so um, and we don't we want to avoid confrontation. Um, and so we want pleasure and we want to avoid pain. And yeah. so I think what happens is that through life we learn what's the easiest way to avoid pleasure or to gain pleasure and avoid pain. Oh, alcohol. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, that's easy. I don't have to do anything. I can just drink and all of a sudden I don't have to feel the pain and I can get the pleasure. Yeah. Um, avoidance. That's easier. I can avoid the pain. Um, you know, um, addiction. Oh, that's easy. I don't have to just keep on doing the drugs. Whereas all of the strategies that help us to build and maintain healthy relationships and make good decisions, it's like, you know, Arno, you got to pause, you got to reflect, you got to spend time thinking about it. Um, I was just working with one of my uh, team members who's having some trouble on a team. And he's like, I just want to tell people, you know, give them, I want to just give them the feedback. And I said, I know that, but do you want them to continue working with you? <laughs> <laughs> and so like, if you want to just, you know, rip someone's work to shreds, go for it. You know, you'll feel better that you, you know, you, you, you made all the you know, changes that were better yeah. according to your perspective, but, um, no one's going to want to work with you. Yeah. So it takes so, effort to give constructive feedback so that people grow as opposed to feel like they are unsupported. Because so like if you, a few minutes ago, we talked about this idea of uh, you need to be open or emotionally intelligent to be able to receive feedback. But then there is also the other side of it that the person who is giving it, it has to know how to do it, right? 100%. Or also has to have emotional intelligence to give it or not. Definitely, because, I mean, feedback is, a, is an art form, you know? And so I think most people don't give feedback because of emotion. They fear the response of yeah. the recipient. For sure. Or they don't know how to skillfully do it, so they just are, it's easier to avoid. Easier in the short run. It's so much harder in the long run, though, when you, you know, because once the challenging behavior, let's say on a team, metastasizes, it's a lot harder to fix. So I really feel like we need to teach people how to give emotionally intelligent feedback early on. And that means that it's about understanding your feelings during that process and understanding the other person's feelings and trying to figure out the strategy that's going to be most helpful to achieve the outcome. What, what kind of strategies uh, could you apply? Like, let's say after a, a day of work, um, things hasn't going very well, maybe, and I'm a bit depressed. Um, what would be a strategy, for example, to, to, yeah, to deal with that at that point in time? Like, are there a few, you know, is it different for everyone or are there also a few strategies that are universally applicable? Probably not uh, mm -hmm. drinking a, a nice cold one after work is probably not the best strategy, but I think a lot of people opt well, for that. I'm one. not judging. I, you know, I love a good glass of wine. Yeah. It's after the fourth that, you know, it's like a little yeah. problem. Yeah, it might be a problem. <laughs> um, so you're talking about just like rough day at work and you're transitioning home and you're feeling a little down. Yeah. Or you're talking about in the process of giving feedback. Uh, well, like I said, you were mentioning like, okay, I'm getting feedback from someone or maybe I am noticing myself that I'm having a particular mm -hmm. emotion. And then uh, you said like, oh, there might be some strategies uh, in order for you to, to, to deal with the emotion or to, 
channel it in a more positive way, if not, you know, something like that. So I was just wondering yeah. like, what kind of strategies um, well, yeah, firstly, would, would that be? Firstly, it's permission to feel, right? It's yeah. all good. There's no judgment. Right. I think, you know, if it's a strong, unpleasant emotion where you're activated, mm -hmm. like anxiety or fear or something like that, you got to do some down regulation strategies, some breathing exercises, right? Something yep. to just m decrease the physiological activation that's putting you in that kind of like fight, flight, freeze mode. Yeah. yeah. Really important. Uh, it's not the end all be all. Some people think, you know, if I breathe, everything's going to be fine. No. Yeah. It's, it's one pathway towards healthy regulation. Yeah. The other is really important, which is having an understanding of your self talk. You know, so many of us are self saboteurs. We're self critics. Yeah. I'm too fat. I'm too skinny. I'm a terrible father. You know, I'm a terrible boss. Nobody likes me. I never get nothing ever works right for me. Again, easy to develop that negative self criticism. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so how do you pause and say, Mark, you're working, you're leading a team of 60 during this pandemic. You're really putting in all the effort possible. You're doing the best you can. And you know what? That's good enough. It's good enough. You're not going to, no one can be a superhero during these times. It's really hard. No. Or you get into a fight with your partner and you feel awful and you say to yourself, you know, really, why was I so activated by that? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, like, is this is this thing that I'm so pissed off about right now? Am I really going to not sleep about it tonight? Or is it yes. just like, <laughs> yes? Well, if it is right, then you have to figure out a different solution, right? But that you have to ask yeah. questions, right? You know, because some of the stuff that I complain of, like for me, uh, my partner is not as conscientious as I am about like buying things. Mm -hmm. So like, I'm very like, I could tell you what I paid for, like the chair that I'm sitting in 10 years ago. I just have that brain. Um, and my partner is not, does not have that brain. Yeah. And so I'm like, how much did it cost? I don't know. What do you mean? How could you, I don't mean you, how do you, what do you mean you don't know? <laughs> like, you actually, remember you gave the credit card and you signed the thing. Like, yeah. didn't you look at it? <laughs> I did, but you know, whatever. And then. All right. So that's been a problem. We've been together 27 years and so far, like memory of what things cost has not improved. <laughs> um, but the other news is that we're not broke. Um, and you know, so like, I mean, if we were like $25,000, I might have a complete, you know, freak out, but like, do I need like, do you see what I'm saying? It's like, is that a yeah. fish that I need to fry or do I just let that fish go back in the water yeah. and just say, you know what, this yeah. is agreed to. But it you took know, you a this, few, uh, right. It took a few incidents, I guess, for you to really realize like, you know what, this is just how it is. Let's 25 just... years. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's uh... still going and then, on. <laughs> and if I, if like, and if the stock market is going down that day and if I'm in a bad mood, I, it's a nightmare. Yeah. And so I'm like, Mark, and that's that. Then you have to recognize going back to strategies. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, you are responding this way today because it's a rainy day. Because you think the world is coming to an end because the stock market has gone, the stock market has gone down a few hundred points. Yeah. yeah. The stock market has been going up and down since its inception. Yeah. It's going to be fine. You got to, you got to let go because you have no control over it. Yeah. So like <clears throat> allowing dip in the stock market to have power over how you treat your partner. Like, come on, that's yeah. pretty freaking ridiculous. <laughs> oh boy. But do you all relate to me? Do you relate to me like, like a deal at 100%. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But it, it 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 definitely takes some discipline uh, to be able to have that conversation with yourself in the heat of the moment, right? But I guess you know yeah. that yeah. circles back to the point of you know ten years of hapkido training, uh, right? You, you yeah. just have to keep on doing this kind of stuff to be able well, to. But it, so you got to prevention is better than intervention. Yeah. So the more you know about how you're likely to respond and the emotions that you're going to have, yeah. the better prepared you'll be. And so, 
It's like if, you're, for, if you drive to work, just one second, if you yep, drive yep. to work and you've had this like shitty day, before you enter your house, you, t- you sit in your car for three minutes and take some breaths and say, how am I going to enter into this house being the best possible husband? Yeah, I actually yeah. do that now. I just wait a few minutes before I go in. That, that actually great. helps. But I was wondering, um, you know, prevention is better. I, I get that. But did you ever research on meditation, for example? Like people yeah. meditate every day? Yeah, there's plenty of good research on that. I think, you know, what the meditation does is similar to the breathing, is that it helps us with lots of things. It can help us kind of just feel generally less anxious and overwhelmed, less stressed out. It can help us be more present, you know, which is important, like just being more present minded. Um, I tend to be very um, ADD. I mean, my brain is like, I'm always in the future. I'm always thinking about like, what's next. Yeah. And so the meditation can say, you know, help me be, you know, a better participant on a podcast like this. What meditation probably won't do is like save your marriage. <laughs> right. Yeah. If you're like, if you're not happy with like things that you and your husband, partner, your wife do, like you got to work through the problem. Yeah. And that's not, you can't just meditate the problem away. No oh, shit. Sorry. Yeah. You could avoid it. And I think some people use meditation as a form of avoidance, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I think like, it's I'm just, just a coping me- mechanism. Oh, isn't it just a yeah. coping mechanism then? Because if I'm irritated, I should, I say that out loud in the end, because otherwise it just grows, grows, grows. And then, well, you become close to hatred, I think. Well, you're not doing the ruler. If you're doing the ruler, you probably <clears> would uh, <laughs> do different. Yeah. So. I mean, there's, yeah. this is why, you know, emotion regulation, by the way, this is the, my next book that I'm working on is putting all these things together for people, because mm. I think that we get over reliant, um, on one strategy, like mindfulness seems to be like everything yeah. right now. Everybody's mindful. Yeah. Meanwhile, I mean, I meet some people who have studied mindfulness for 50 years and they're like the meanest people I've ever met. <laughs> um, it's, like, uh, it's like, wait a minute, like you didn't even say hello to me in the hallway. Uh, and so I think that we um, overemphasize single strategies as being the answer. So there's permission to feel, there's mindfulness and breathing exercises, there's the self talk strategy. Yep. Yep. Right? Like, what is the story you say to yourself when you fail? I'm an idiot, I'm a loser, or you know what? Everybody makes mistakes. Mark, you know what? Give yourself a break. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then there's the social strategies surrounding yourself with the people that bring you joy and comfort. Yeah. I have to tell you for years, I try to be around people that I didn't even like, cause I thought it was important. Mm. And then I'm like, why am I doing this? I'm not my true yeah. self with these people. Yeah. And so, I mean, do you have a relative, like an aunt or an uncle or a teacher or a friend or a brother or a sister or somebody that just whenever you're with them, you just feel more at ease. Yeah. Yeah. Very much. Yeah. yeah. And I also have the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so, but you know, the prevention scientist says, I'm going to spend the holidays with the people who make me feel content, not the yeah. people who make me agitated. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. Yeah. So I, I do wonder this, right? Like for example, because you, you mentioned a few times uh, in this episode, something like I, I don't judge. Is there a place for judgment on any of this at some point? As let's say with a friend or with a relative, or with your partner doing something that you don't like in a way you judge or don't. And when I think about, let's say, if I have a relative or a friend or colleague that I dislike or doesn't bring me easy, isn't also my responsibility to try to help that person to become a bit more, I don't know, self-aware <laughs> or self-aware yeah. or it depends. You know, like you can't be responsible for everybody else's behavior because that's going to drive you crazy. Yeah. You know, I, I went down that route many times and, you know, if someone has a personality disorder, stay away um, <laughs> and you're not going to change their behavior. Right. It's too complicated. You know, I have an aunt, you know, she was in her late sixties, seventies and 
everything was like, she was so judgmental, you know? And, um, and my, I realized in the end that I just had to stay away from this, this relative yeah. because, you know, she was very set in her ways. Now, at the same time, I also needed to have the courage to give this person feedback about the way they treated me and other people. And that was the hard part saying, yeah. you know, God, when you say these things to my brother, like it doesn't, it just yeah. it really doesn't feel good. Sounds yeah. a bit like the boundary yeah. book. <clears throat> yeah. So we've been talking a lot about, uh, you know, that emotions are, uh, you know, okay to have, that you have permission to feel. And, um, you know, I think I already know the answer, but I'm going to ask the question anyway. Um, so are there situations where it is necessary to maybe disregard emotions entirely? Uh, like, let's say, uh, you know, something like on the scale of a 9-11 disaster or you're a, you know, soldier in war, you know, fighting for your life. Um, right. We have the pandemic now with Omicron, um, you know, yeah. Would there be places where it's okay to say like, no, nope, there's no permission to feel right now. We need to get through this crisis first and then we can deal with emotions later. Is that ever okay? I think it's about the framing of it. I think that you can still give yourself the permission to feel and not allow the feeling to have power over you. Right. Um, you know, sometimes you do want to compartmentalize, you know, I'll give you the example. Like when my dad died, mm -hmm. it was the day before I had to do this big keynote presentation at a conference. And so I had to decide, you know, if I canceled it, it was going to look really bad because I was the only presenter. Mm -hmm. and it was in like a big hotel in New York City. Like, oof, that's not going to go so well. Yeah. At the same point, I was feeling tremendous loss and grief and sadness. Third, yeah. I was thinking, you know, my father, you know, my father was like a worker and he would have said to me, Mark, you get up and like, what are you going to sit around and come? You're going to sit around and cry about me? Get up on that stage and do that presentation. <laughs> yeah. Make some money. Um, and, um, and so, you know, when I did the talk, I had to make a choice and I decided to put my grief and sadness in a box for two hours Yeah. and it worked fine. And I, you know, I did some little things during my presentation, like in terms of like thinking about my dad, but in a, in a beautiful, nostalgic, positive way. Yeah. I didn't go into the whole story about how my father had died the day before. Cause I didn't think that would be, it would be the audience might think, oh, yeah. God, this guy's, like, you know, yeah. chatting not. too much. And so it's like, basically there's a lot of discernment in this work, you know, and a lot of contextualization and, you know, I also knew that if, when I had to do this talk that I, I was, I brought my brother with me and I like, so I had like someone in the audience that I could just like check in on Yeah, that kind of was my stability. Yeah. Um, so he was not crying there. No, I actually, okay. he, he got mad at me because I, I actually, you know, talked about my childhood and how my parents, you know, were emotionally not the best and, you know, would scream and yell and, I watched my brother like freaking out in the audience. Oh, I think you, you know, this is stories was from the book, isn't it? I think I it that. is. Yeah. yeah. They were like, so they were so angry with me that I was, you know, talking about my dysfunctional childhood. Um, but that was, you know, that's my strategy. Right. I think that's a question I have then, like how is for your relatives then, do you feel guilty that you tell the stories about that? Let's say for example, for your father, your mother, because Normally when I share those stories here, I feel guilty for my parents somehow like, oh, if they listen to this and yeah. they don't, I would feel like extremely weird about it. I mean, to be fully honest with you, you know, both my parents passed away. So I felt like I could say whatever I want. <laughs> <laughs> but your brother's still there. And I also decided, and I also believe me, if I would have shared everything about my brothers, they would have just... I wouldn't be on this podcast right now. <laughs> I, I really was like super careful about, you know, I'm not going to disrespect my brothers yeah, you know, yeah. Um, and say things about, you know, their lives, it's their private lives. It's not for me exactly. to be the, uh, yeah. the judge. I mean, I do judge them enormously, but um, I don't need to make that public. 
the, no. uh, but I think, you know, it's interesting. Um, like, can you, I mean, people have, you know, Freud actually said that, that people may not ever be able to be their full authentic selves until their parents are no longer with them. So Which do you is, agree? Uh, Meaning when they're dead or when you move out from house? No, when oh. they're gone. I mean, we, should, we, we probably don't want to end the podcast on this. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> probably not. I don't know, actually. <laughs> so, Mark, now you have the responsibility to turn the tongue. <laughs> I know. Like, what did I just get myself into? Um, yeah. The uh, Actually, you know, all the things that I did say in my book about my parents, we, had, we talked about. Uh, I was very open with my father. And my father, interestingly enough, as he grew older, deeply appreciated this work and um, and understood its value. Well, that's that's nice. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And my mother, too. My mother died very young. Um, you know, and I, I often think, um, you know, my mother didn't have a good emotion education. She grew up in a very neurotic family. And, like, I feel, you know, I just wish, you know, I feel in many ways my mother didn't get to reach her full potential because of her inability to deal with her stress and anxiety and fear. Yeah. And so, you know, one of the things that I'll say that's a, maybe also a little off, you know, no, is that okay. you are um, <laughs> observing my mother, for example, and her frustration with some aspects of her life motivated me, right, to yeah. to not replicate that lifestyle. Yeah. Like, I don't want to end up having all these regrets, or I don't want to end up not achieving my goals in life. And so what do I need to learn? What strategies do I need to develop, right, to, uh, to ensure that my dreams come true? Yeah, for sure. I think uh, at least I can uh, agree on that one, that uh, I don't want to make some of the same mistakes that my parents did. Uh, so at least, you know, I'm very, uh, how do you say that I, I'm aware of certain choices that, that my parents made that I don't want to make and, uh, or at least different ones. So, uh, at least, you know, I'm trying to, yep. uh, keep that, keep that going. So uh, to, uh, to maybe end on a, on a positive note here, um, okay. <laughs> so you mentioned that you're working on a new book, but also before we started this podcast, you mentioned that your your permission to feel book is actually going to get released uh, in Dutch for all of our yes. Dutch listeners here. Uh, and he that's going to probably uh, be a problem for you, but uh, you, I thank know. God you already read the book uh, in its uh, pure form. Maybe a yeah. Portuguese translation will uh, will hit the market soon as well. I, my book is already out in Portuguese. Oh, there we oh, go. See? There we go. <laughs> it's yeah, but I need to give to my parents. Permissão para sentir. Yeah. All right. So that is it. Yeah. So uh, be on the lookout for that one. Uh, yeah. So uh, Mark, I don't know if you have anything uh, left to add for uh, for the audience or anything you still want to say. You know, I have to say, you know, I wasn't sure how this was going to go. Uh, and um, it's fun to talk with three guys about feelings. Yeah, I feel like we should go. Maybe we can go on the road and do a whole thing on this. Yeah, for sure. Um, but scared to do to that. Man. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Look at it. Do the whole rule of thing. Well, on uh, my note, I would like to thank you a lot because your book indeed, and this is not like uh, just words. It did change me. It was yeah, changing like uh, the partner that I have right now. And then I asked these guys to read, and they all read, and now basically changed the way how we work. Yeah. It created a lot of problems on that, too, yes. because now we don't know how to deal with a lot of things. But uh, it definitely opened uh, yeah, a door for me. That, uh, yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for your work. It is pretty nice. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, you know, maybe when my book comes out in uh, Dutch, I can uh, come visit you guys over. What town, where, are you based that. where are you based in the Netherlands? Well, we're in Utrecht, but uh, we can be anywhere. The country is so yeah. tiny. <laughs> I think I've actually been to that town. Is there a university there? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I might even have somebody who I used to train, who worked with me that's a professor there. Okay. Oh. Um, and then I've been to, what's that other town? Amsterdam. 
No, I've been to Amsterdam, but it's another one. With a university? With an yeah. Rotterdam. With an O. With an O. Which one? Rotterdam? Or it starts with an O? No. I don't know. It's one that's under by the water. Oh, man. <laughs> the whole country. Yeah. <laughs> Delft, maybe. Yeah. Uh, well, we can. Uh, but I gotta say, I'm anyway. pretty pleased it's gonna be in Dutch. To be honest, I think my wife would like it Thank a lot. You. Because uh, for me, it was like, I, th- I think it's okay English, but I know a lot of people it's a bigger issue. So if it's in Dutch, pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that. I'm excited yeah. for it to come out. Yeah. 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 If right. you ever well, come guys. by uh, Holland, of course, man, you're welcome. I think it's great. I and when your that. new book is there, please come back. Yes. Yeah. I appreciate that, and um, I hope you have a great holiday break. Do you celebrate the holidays in the Netherlands? Yes, yeah, we do. Yeah, it's going to be uh, great. So. Hopefully, uh, even uh, the weather is getting a bit colder, so I don't know if it's going to be a white Christmas, but uh, there might be a chance here. So uh, it's looking good. Cool. So, uh, yeah, Mark, thank you very much. Uh, I also want to thank the listener, of course, for tuning in. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to send us an email at the podcast at forscouts.nl. Uh, we are also on Twitter. That's at forscouts. Uh, Mark, uh, can people reach you maybe if they have any uh, questions or remarks on Twitter no. or anywhere else? No? Unreachable? No. I'm kidding. <laughs> I don't talk to people. I can't stand people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I think I'm on Twitter, which is my name, Mark Bracken. I'm on Instagram. I'm also, my website has all the information about my book, which okay. is www.markbracket.com. All right. We'll include that yep. in the description here. Thank all right. you. Thank you very much, guys. See ya. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody.